I've seen my share of dames come and go in this concrete jungle. But Dorothy Kilgallen was something else. A real firecracker with a pen sharper than a serpent's tooth and a mind quicker than a rumor in D.C. When they found her cold body in her swanky townhouse, I knew there was more to the story than met the eye. I just didn't know how much more. My name's not important. I'm a private eye. It was November 8, 65, and the Big Apple was rotting from the inside out. Kilgallen had been playing with fire, digging into JFK's dirt like a dog with a bone. She'd been yapping about breaking the story of the century, but instead, she broke her last headline. The scene was staged like a Broadway flop. There she was, propped up in bed like a mannequin in a department store window, still dolled up with makeup, fake lashes, and a flower in her hair. It was all wrong, like a teetotaler in a speakeasy. The official story was as smooth as aged whiskey, an overdose with a fatal combination of booze and pills. But something didn't sit right. Most people took the story at face value, but I started sniffing around, and the stench of cover-up was stronger than a docker's armpit. First stop, the Regency Hotel. The canary named Catherine Stone was singing about Kilgallen cozying up to a mystery man the night she kicked the bucket. Word on the street was it might have been Ron Pataki, an out-of-town scribbler with more secrets than a confessional booth. This Pataki character was slippery, denying everything faster than Ruby's bullet took out Oswald. I dug deeper, like a grave robber trying to overtake the coming dawn. Turned out our gal Dorothy had been playing a dangerous game, chasing leads on the JFK hit job that made the Warren Commission look like a nursery rhyme. She called their report laughable, a gutsy move for a dame in a man's world. Kilgallen had been a regular on that What's My Line show playing guessing games with the high and mighty. But off camera, she was playing for higher stakes. She'd even ruffled the feathers of the big birds at the FBI, with J. Edgar Hoover himself getting his panties in a twist over her scoops. Seems she'd published Jack Ruby's testimony before the ink was dry on the court reporter's notes. The autopsy report of her death was more suspect than the smile of a used car salesman. Some egghead lawyer named Mark Shaw had cracked it open years later. His investigation, finding more pills in her system than a hypochondriac's medicine cabinet. Secondol, Tuanol, Nebutol. It was a regular alphabet soup of barbiturates. And then there was the powder on her nightstand glass. It screamed foul play louder than a carnival barker with a megaphone. I tracked down the quack who'd prescribed her the second all. He was clean as a whistle, which, ironically, only muddied the waters from my investigation. Where'd the other pills come from? It was a puzzle with more missing pieces than a dollar store jigsaw. The deeper I dug, the murkier it got. Kilgallen had been stirring up a hornet's nest, buzzing around crime boss Carlos Marcello and his possible connection to Kennedy's curtain call. She was planning a trip to the Big Easy, but instead took a one-way ticket to the Big Sleep. Marcello had the motive, means, and opportunity. A trifecta if we were at the racetrack. I got my mitts on some FBI files that were more redacted than a censor's wet dream. But between the black lines, a picture emerged. They'd been tailing Kilgallen like a bloodhound on a scent, tracking her every move from Florida to Dallas. She'd been poking her nose into Castro, Cuba, and more three-letter agencies than I could possibly remember. As I pieced it together, the picture got uglier. 
Kilgallen had made enemies faster than a snake oil salesman at a science fair. From Sinatra to the feds, from the mob to mystery men, she had danced with the devil and the music had stopped. Old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra, had a grudge against her that could curdle milk. He'd sent her a tombstone once, a not-so-subtle hint that was about as funny as a hangover on Monday morning. All because she'd spilled the beans on his love life in 56. Hell hath no fury like a crooner scorned. I dug up dirt on her husband, Dick Colmar. They'd been thick as thieves once, even had their own radio show. But word on the street was their marriage had crumbled like a brittle bone in a hard fall. Still, he claimed she was in high spirits that last night. High spirits? Or high on pills? In Manhattan, it's hard to tell the difference. The kicker? Gilgallan's prized possession, her file on the Kennedy assassination, had vanished like a magician's assistant. Poof. Gone without a trace. In the end, Dorothy Kilgallen was just another headline in a city that eats its young. But as long as there are guys like me around, her story won't stay buried. Because in this town, the truth is like a dame in a red dress. Hard to ignore, and even harder to forget. I lit another cigarette and poured myself a stiff drink. The Kilgallen case has gone cold, but I'm not ready to let it go, not by a long shot. In the city of broken dreams and shattered lives, Dorothy Kilgallen's ghost still whispers, and I aim to listen. The truth is out there, hiding in the shadows, and I'll keep chasing it until the last street light flickers out, or until my light flickers out. <laughs> <laughs>